Okay, I see no no one uh, no one else popping up or, or waiting to connect, and it's a couple of minutes past half past. So um, I'll just run through uh, the format, um, and as I say that, someone else pops in. Um, uh, I'll just run through um, the, the format um, for um, this evening. Um, so uh, just, I suppose, a quick um, pointer that the um, Zoom call is being recorded uh, and it will be on um, YouTube in a few days. So if you want to listen back and hear the questions and hear the answers, then that is an option for you. But I just wanted to let you know that um, if you could make sure that you are um, all on mute, um, that would be great. And then if you have any, any questions as we go along, if you could type them in the chat and then as we go through, I can ask you to um, ask your question um, so you can come off mute and, and have that. Um, the session, we expect it to last around an hour. Um, hopefully it will be a, a nice and formal session so we can have a good debate. Um, and I will do my best to, to chair it as, as well as possible virtually. Um, but we're, we're going to start, um, I suppose, start the, uh, this evening with an introduction from Vera. Uh, and then we can go on to um, go into some some questions and 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 go from there. So um, over to you, Vera. Thank you very much, Graham, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for having me tonight. It's exciting that the leadership contest have, has now started, and I have taken this contest seriously because I think as a party we deserve a good contest. And um, my team has been preparing this for a while, and we've been um, quite busy creating a brand, a website, um, and if you are interested um, to further explore what I stand for, please go into my website, um, www.verahophouse.org.uk. Here's my pitch. I believe the biggest threat to liberalism comes from the political right. And we need to take ownership of what has happened in the last 10 years and what the consequences and the legacy of the coalition government was. We now have one of the most right-wing governments in decades. We have um, created, we, we were ultimately a, a, a 10 years of austerity that has created one of the most divided and, and biggest inequality societies that we have had. A government that has destroyed us nearly as a political party in 2015 and a government that delivered Brexit. So while all of that was, of course, not intended in 2010, and I was there in the conference hall in Birmingham, and I voted for the coalition enthusiastically, I do believe that we need to take responsibility and look back and, and make a clean break from the coalition. And I myself was surprised, actually, I was a very um, keen supporter of Joe Swinton, how even in 2019, we couldn't really break with the coalition government. So I do believe we need a leader um, that is not in any ways linked to the coalition government. That's my, my, my first pitch. My second pitch is, I used to be a councillor for 10 years. I was a councillor in Rochdale up in the Northwest between 2004 and 2014. I believe we are uh, uh, strongest um, as a party that represents communities. We, are, we always provide the best local councillors. We believe in local democracy, local decision making. Um, and the power of um, local community politics and grassroots politics. And I, as a candidate, I'm the one who can most honestly represent that because I was there. I was a, um, a, a, a councillor longer than I've been an MP. I also think it's an advantage that I have actually politically worked um, in, the, in the Northwest. I, I, I grew up politically um, in the Northwest. Um, I have been a very much closely working with very left behind communities. But now I'm representing um, a well-off constituency in Bath. So to have seen that diversity and understand really that one size doesn't fit all. And we as liberals can be strong liberals, but cha um, 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 challenging um, uh, parties and, and tendencies and, and, and movements from different uh, political sides. So I've stood against the Tories, I've stood against Labour. I think that is important to understand. And last not, but not least, um, I call myself a hard liberal. I, come, I grew up in Germany, as a lot of people know. I grew up in West Germany. I became politically active 
um, I, as a student, I wasn't independent, but I always say I fought the communists. So in those days, um, the threat to liberalism came from the left. But I understood in those days that um, while we are a tolerant party and we want to create as much working together as possible, uh, we also have to uh, draw the lines where we um, fight intolerance and we can't just fight intolerance with tolerance. We have to be we have to be firm and steely about standing up for our values and drawing lines where uh, we can go no further with cooperation. So these are the sort of four pillars on which I put my pitch. I am currently the spokesperson to, um, for, for the climate emergency and climate action. I was a passionate anti-Brexit campaigner. I'm a passionate campaigner for um, uh, tackling the climate emergency. And again, I believe it is important that um, we are uncompromising about um, tackling the climate emergency. And yes, um, I believe um, in forming a progressive alliance. That is not a new thing. Uh, we were most successful under Paddy Ashton and Charlie Kennedy. Those were the, the years when, when we did best electorally. Of course, we need to reformulate what it, what it means to be in a progressive alliance um, in 2020, 2021. But I do believe um, our answer to the, the political threat to liberalism is a progressive alliance. I leave that here because I think um, we can discuss a lot more through your questions. Um, and over to you to ask me challenging questions. Okay, so um, we do have a couple of questions on the chat, which is great. Um, I think. Um, Liam, if we can ask yours first, because that is, uh, I suppose, linked um, to um, Vera's opening pitch, and then we can go from there. So, Liam, if you want to come off mute. Hello, yeah. Thank you, Graham. Um, yes, nice to meet you, Vera. So, just as you were saying uh, straight off with your, the Progressive Alliance that you'd like to do with Labour and the Green Party, what I'm interested in is with uh, such a popular arguably liberal, certainly centre leader in Keir Starmer, uh, which at the moment it seems is going to be quite popular with the Liberal Democrat voters. How will you as leader make sure he won't take all the centre, centre-left votes from us? Very good question. Um, you guys actually in Bedford, you have shown how to work in a progressive alliance and make progress. I think it, we are very clearly a different party and the Labour Party has not suddenly changed um, because they have got a different leader. Um, we clearly come from very different polit political traditions. We um, are liberals and we believe strongly um, in the rights of the individual. We are supporting um, uh, more strongly than any other party um, human rights and civil liberties. The, the Labour Party always ends up with a tendency of collectivism and um, somewhat authoritarian tendencies, which is very different from us. We don't um, actually um, look at society always through the prism of, of a class war. We believe in the right of every citizen globally and nationally to have a good life, free from fear and free from um, discrimination and free from oppression. And we don't think that everything that we see in terms of injustice is just, can just be interpreted through a class war. I believe we um, want to tackle the climate emergency in, in quite different ways. And I've said, I, I think um, uh, if you want to formulate what we are as liberals, we can probably formulate that best through our answers of how we respond to the climate emergency. And, and, other, and different from the Labour Party, we actually believe in the dynamism and the energy of business. We don't see the business always as a class enemy. We understand that business creates wealth. Um, and we want to harness that, um, that power and energy from business, but we also understand, and that's why we're different, obviously, from, from the right-wing liberalism, um, we, we, we believe in well-regulated businesses through state intervention in order to protect the vulnerable. But we are clearly different from the Labour Party, and we should not be afraid um, to actually put um, ourselves firmly in the progressive centre-left. We are different from the Labour Party. And I'm sure we can clearly um, um, uh, formulate our political or philosophical differences to politics. Thank you very much, Liam. Is was that was that okay? Any, any follow up from that? Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And um, Gordon, I think you have a connected question. Would you like to come off mute? 
Yes. Um, in, in your pitch, you described how you moved on, shall we say, from the last gen general election. Uh, you moved on from the coalition. But what else would you have done differently, possibly with the benefit of hindsight, if you'd been leader in the last general election in December? Well, um, I had internal discussions with my colleagues um, all through the summer that, um, you know, we had to understand that if we were the anti-Brexit anti party, and it was clearly the thing that brought us back into the limelight, and whether we like it or not, and I know that it wasn't the most popular message uh, in all areas of the country, certainly not um, in the Northwest, and it was difficult in the Southwest as well. Uh, but it was the thing that clearly differentiated us and propelled us back onto the national stage. So if we were um, the party that was most passionately anti-Brexit for many good reasons, and we can go, go to that, then we, sh we, we needed to understand that we could only achieve that by going somewhat together with the Labour Party and firing so much um, uh, of our, uh, our ammunition against Corbyn in the same way as firing um, against Boris Johnson, we shot ourselves in the foot. Um, and the only answer then when people said, well, in the extremist, on which side would you fall? Would it be Johnson? Would it be Corbyn? Uh, our answer was we would be the next prime minister. And that just didn't wash and people didn't um, buy that. And it, it became more and more of an issue actually during the election campaign that clearly we weren't going to provide the next prime minister. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I, I, I wouldn't have picked that message at all. Certainly in combination with we will revoke Article 50, it, it became more and more disastrous throughout the election. Um, we could have um, possibly modified that revoke um, message through the election. But I think the arrogance with which we went into the election saying we could actually become the next prime minister i think that was the central mistake we should have been more humble and understanding that we could only deliver um, a, 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 an anti-brexit anti-johnson um, outcome if we were going to work together with the progressive parties one one other thing that actually um, just thinking back to the, the previous question which i forgot um why we are so different from labor and and why we think uh, we as a party need to move forward, going away from a centralized message about putting everything in, in, in the context of winning national elections. I think we need to understand that we can only win if we win locally first. And our focus has to be so much more on winning locally and we differentiate ourselves from Labour best. And you will know that from your local area, that we are just the best community activists. We are the best people working um, on the ground and winning elections from the, from the grassroots upwards. And it was completely misguided to think that we could win out of the blue all sorts of areas where we hadn't really um, um, strong liberal Democrat um, local stronghold. So the, the, the sheer arrogance of thinking that we compete like a national party I think was the biggest mistake. We need to build from the grassroots up. Thank you very much. Uh, Gordon, is that any follow-up questions? That the fact that you are partially rejecting being a national party rather than uh, uh, in favor of a co coalition of local um, activists, local campaigners, um, is unsettling because I'm not in politics, and never have been for the last 50 years, because of local issues. I'm involved, I'm, I'm interested in education and the economy and social services and poverty. Uh, and these are national issues. And, uh, and talking to my Labour colleagues in the last general election, they, Brexit was never the first issue for them. It may have been in the press, but it, it was a whole wow. range of things. And I, must, I, I would merely make the comment that uh, your, your last answer has unsettled me. Thank you. Um, okay, can I just come back to that? But if, when I say um, that, that our, our balance needs to shift back to local issues, that, that doesn't mean that I'm sort of keeping completely out of the national picture. Of course, as a national leader, you need to understand, you can't just sort of walk back and say, well, I'm only going to talk about street nights um, or our uh, whatever, um, our local plan. Of course, we need to understand that 
as a national party, we need to get involved in national issues. Um, and Brexit was a national issue, uh, but it wasn't particularly popular, as you say, uh, in, 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 in all um, of our council, uh, in all of our areas. Uh, but I mean, tackling the climate emergency, I cannot think of a more burning national inter and international issue. But if you look at how we deliver that and how we are actually uh, addressing practically what we do about the climate emergency, you will know that a lot of, of council areas and councils actually get involved in how to respond to the climate emergency. Of course, I'm not abdicating my responsibility as a leader to say, well, what would be our national plan about getting to net zero? And indeed, we have a very strong plan. And I can point to many failings um, of this national Tory government where they are failing. I wasn't going to imply that I'm completely retreating from the national scene. I'm just saying, I think it is important that we rebalance as a party our attention to the local level because we've become far too centralized and that didn't work for us. And we need to shift some of the balance um, to our local areas and allow local parties and local areas to make their own fortunes, particularly winning back from the local level. That was my, that was really what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And I, I, I think we have a, I suppose, a, a, a link um, question. But a, a link question um, to that from uh, Rashid. Um, are you okay to uh, ask about that? It's a question from uh, Rashid and Dorothea. Uh, if you become the party leader, would you want to make rejoining the EU party policy? Um, so I have just said, and if you have followed some of my, um, my, my political career, I was one of the most passionate anti-Brexit campaigners. Um, and I, I, cannot, I cannot describe to you my um, my depression really um, after 2019 although December two, 2019 although I won my seat back with a, an enormous majority but you know the national picture obviously looked very bleak and I had to I had to acknowledge and said it publicly um, the fight um, to stop Brexit is over and I think we we all need to acknowledge that that immediate fight to stop Brexit is over but keeping the flame of joining, rejoining the European Union at some point in the future, I think is almost a historic mission for the Liberal Democrats. And I've come to that conclusion after I spoke to the Swiss ambassador during the last um, autumn conference. And he came to me and said, in Switzerland, um, the Swiss people through a referendum made a decision in the early 1990s to not become members of the European Union. They were in the ascendancy. Um, and ever since, none of the political, none of the major political parties have ever mentioned again that that should be an aspiration for the Swiss people. And ever since, they are stuck um, in, in an awkward position of bilateral agreements with the European Union, which is hugely unsatisfactory. And he believes that if one of the political parties had dared to keep um, uh, the, the flame alive of that, their place should be at the center of the European project, and then they wouldn't be where they are. And he believes that the Liberal Democrats might have a similar historic mission. And, and, and I, I believe that is probably true. One of the parties in this country needs to keep the European flame alive. That doesn't mean that I make that immediately um, a party policy so uh, uh, that the rest of the country can take us up to pieces over oh, the Liberal Democrats have still not got the message that we, we are leaving the European Union and have, le have left the European Union. But at every moment, uh, remembering the British people, why it is a disadvantage to be outside the European Union, and we'll probably see that and notice that very soon, um, particularly in, um, after coming, up, uh, you know, coming out of the COVID crisis. I think that is the, the, the thing we should go, continuously reminding the British public that it is a disadvantage to be outside the European Union, not just in terms of trade, but in terms of international research, in terms of data, data sharing, in terms of um, security, um, that the British people will, will, will understand that we didn't just, we weren't just anti-Brexit for the hell of it, but because there were very good reasons for it. So picking the issues carefully, um, and not in a too shrill, shrill, shrill a way um, to, to, to make the point that really our place is at the heart of the European Union and of, at the heart of the European project. I think that's where we should go. When exactly, I, and I don't think we should as a party allow ourselves to be nailed on when that rejoin should be, 
but as a as a as as an ideal i um for the future it has to be kept alive because it can very quickly slip away and switzerland i think is a, is, is a very good example for that thank you okay uh do you have a follow-up question Rashida? was that is that okay that's fine thank you great thank you very much okay and then uh, I think moving can on. I, uh, Graham, can I just say, um, I mean, we, because we are a relatively small group, um, Rashid, if you want to sort of put your own opinion in, in, into the room, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Um, and that goes to everybody. You, 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 can, you can always say what you think as well, because we, ha we are having a discussion here, don't we? Yes. No, we, I think we agree with you very much. Thank you. You explained it very well. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, I suppose sticking to um, more uh, national issues, um, Dean, did you want to ask your question? Can I yeah, do you, um, my question do you mind if David mind Sawyer can ask his, because I think uh, he thanks, was Dean. first on the list. Yeah, yeah uh, sorry, I was just trying to get yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry David. I've, 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 All right. If I if I do two, one one the first one is probably quite lengthy. The second one should be very quick. So would you would you forgive me if I just put two together here? No, it's fine. I mean, yes, I forgive you. <laughs> okay. Where I'm, I'm just to introduce myself. I'm a local borough councillor in Bedford. Um, my first question is about COVID. So, what's your view on the way the government has managed the COVID crisis? And if you were party leader now, what would you do about it? And the second question is. Should we be taking down all the Gladstone statues? Okay, two very separate issues. Let me start yes. with number one. I, uh, again, within my own parliamentary party, I've been quite unhappy that we haven't been more critical about the handling of the COVID crisis uh, from the very beginning. I thought um, the way the Tory government responded to it was very much a right-wing response. It was um, about uh, trying to keep the economy going for as long as possible. It was, uh, there was for too long this idea about what was called the herd immunity. They don't really like that word anymore, but it was about thinking, you know, the strongest and fittest will survive and we'll lose um, a, a few vulnerable and elderly people. And, and uh, the, the price for that is fine as long as we keep the economy going. I thought it was an absolutely appalling response and no liberal, um, minded government would ever responded in the same way um, as that and if you're now looking across um, uh, the world and the global response from the Bolsonaros and Trumps of this world um, fit very much with that. They, they just tried to deny the severity of the pandemic and they tried to um, sort of wave it off as just another bit of flu um, and those countries um, are probably going to be the ones um, heading um, the, world's, uh, the world in terms of um, fatality numbers. And uh, fair enough, the US is a much bigger country, so is Brazil. But it is, it is shocking um, how high our, fatality, you know, our, our, our death numbers are and infection numbers are. And we will probably even end up being the country that is economic, economically worst hit because there was a complete misjudgment of what we should have done. We should have locked down a lot earlier. Um, and I was making that point within my, in my parliamentary party. And of course, um, the government very cleverly put themselves in the middle of two scientific advisors and said, we are following the science. And only now do they admit uh, that um, advisors advise and, and politicians make the decisions. And we could have said that. A lot of our response was, uh, the, the government's response was a political decision. The scientists at the time weren't particularly clear and they could have, uh, the, the, the government could have come to a different decision. It wasn't just um, an inevitable consequence of what um, the science was telling the politicians. And we could have said that, to my mind, it, it was very, very obvious from the very beginning. On the 11th um, of March, um, we had a um, budget, uh, the, the budget debate, and it started off with Rishi Sunak making very bold, um, announcements about it's still about Brexit and what they had achieved and a little bit about COVID and very clearly he said then we are assuming that 60% um, of the British people will get infected by COVID. Five days later they made a massive U-turn because they were advised then by Neil Ferguson that the NHS could not cope, could not cope if we let uh, the COVID, COVID um, virus spread unchecked. All of that we could have said from the very beginning and yet we were very tentative 
Um, why that is possibly uh, as a hangover of um, the old idea that we need to work together and if we were um, be too shrill about it, it would be seen as, um, uh, you know, just wanting to to point political schools. I think if one, um, the, the tone is obviously important um, and we could have said it clearly, rationally, um, and very much based on what we believe in, why, what a government should do, and that is to protect the most vulnerable, not allow the most vulnerable to become victims um, of um, saving the economy. Because the economy is there for people. The economy is not there for itself. So that's my, 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 uh, my stance on COVID. And that, of course, would then, if I had been the leader, would have um, informed um, um, the, the whole of, of, of the progress that we have made through this crisis with not enough PPE. The, the, the sheer um, you know, piracy with which we rejected to work together with the European Union and not um, have enough um, PPE, um, the complete mess about tr um, tracking and tracing, all of this, the mess about uh, messaging, the way that the government then wants to push um, teachers to reopen schools when it is clearly not safe, and the teaching profession, and I was a teacher, has said for a long time, uh, uh, we, we shouldn't open schools, all of that criticism. Um, I would have um, voiced a lot more, a, a lot earlier, rather than when it became popular uh, uh, to criticize the government. So that's my, would have been my response to the COVID crisis. Um, and what about statues? Um, I, uh, uh, Bath is very close to Bristol, so the discussion about Edward Colston, Colston who was a um, uh, a slave trader who made a huge fortune through a barbaric trade, who also was a benefactor and gave large amounts of money um, to the city. I, I have um, said immediately, the, the statue should have gone a long time ago. Yes, of course, we do not, um, we, we, we do not support vandalism and a party that stands um, on, on the rule of law um, and, and you know, public order offenses is obviously nothing that, that any elected um, representative can condone. But when people are coming now and say, these guys who, who, who tore the statue down should, go, you know, should be heavily punished and we need to go after these guys, Nobody was injured in that act. The statue was taken down out of frustration that it was still there. It was thrown into the river. It was a symbolic act. That crime pales into insignificance in, uh, in comparisons to the, to the humanitarian crimes um, that Edward Colston um, has committed himself. So I think we need to, 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 to be very balanced in our response. Should, um, we have a discussion about um, uh, other statues. Yes, we should. Uh, I don't think we should take them all down. Uh, we should recognize um, that there was a particular age when we like to put people on pedestals. Um, how do we deal with this now? Either um, with, with more explanation around a statue, um, but also possibly re removing a few, putting them into museums um, and explaining the context um, in, uh, in, in which um, these people became wealthy or became very charitable, uh, but also question um, the values um, that were behind uh, uh, putting these people on pedestals and that our values have changed and our society has changed. Thanks very much. If I can just come back to you very briefly on the first, the COVID question. I'm going to assume you would support a public inquiry. When do you think it should be? Give just an approximate idea time-wise. A good question. I mean, uh, that is actually one of the things that we have publicly called for um, uh, 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 f from the very beginning or very, very soon. We need a publicly judge-led inquiry into the COVID crisis. I, I think um, knowing um, how the government responds to these things, and, and we've been asking for a publicly led, for a, a judge-led inquiry into the post office scandal just um, during this week, Knowing how long it takes um, if, if, that the government finally gets its act together to respond to that, I think we, we have to continue to push for it. Um, the sooner the better, to be quite honest. Um, and, and, and it could be split into, into a number of uh, different inquiries if need be. Um, but um, certainly as soon as possible, um, we should have a publicly, a, a judge-led inquiry um, about the initial lockdown and why uh, uh, the decision to lockdown wasn't made earlier, because I believe um, it, you know, it could have saved thousands of lives um, if we had gone into lockdown earlier. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I thought uh, I'm trying to group uh, the questions um, into categories. So I think 
uh, Dean, yours would segue in off the back of COVID and uh, potentially uh, welfare reform, um, considering uh, the furlough schemes and, and things that have been announced. So if you want to ask and then there's a few questions on, um, on, the, on the party itself, so then we'll move on to those. Um, so um, Dean, after you. Well, you're on mute, Dean. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Vera, for joining us this evening. I'm also a Bedford Borough Councillor, um, elected last May um, when we were very well popular, and um, elected, I should say, in Bedford Borough because we work really, really hard. Um, in light of um, the inspiration, I basically joined the Liberal Democrats when Nick Clegg was on the telly before the 2010 election, and he did inspire over 20% of the electorate to vote for us at that point. Um, where I feel like it went down was when he walked into the Rose Garden with David Cameron, which I think was a big mistake. Um, but also, particularly, I do think we let people down in terms of the welfare state and the fact that we supported things like the bedroom tax and things like that during that period. Um, it's now moved on to obviously universal credit and discussions about universal basic income. So I'd just like to ask you your views on universal basic income and how you would reform the welfare state? It's a very good question. And, and you know, I think, um, em, you know, emotionally, or however I want to call it, you come absolutely from the same side where I am from. I was a councillor while we were in co coalition up in the Northwest and representing um, a, well, I, I stood against the Tories, but the whole of Rochdale Borough Council, you know, one of the most deprived areas um, in the country. The bedroom tax was just one of the most cynical and cruel things uh, that we could have supported. And it was, as I looked at it at the time, you know, to be quite honest, my, my colleagues in the South hadn't really thought through what it meant. Um, the, the most cynical thing was that we basically in Rochdale, we didn't actually have, have, have the properties uh, to move people into, even if they had wanted to to um, uh, have one bedroom less. So all they ended up with was just a punitive tax and they were landed with it without any fault of their own. And, you know, these sort of mistakes, we should have, uh, if we supported these sort of things, we should have foreseen them and then very quickly said, hang on, we need to pause here um, and not go any further with this. And, and, and yet we just didn't dare to speak up um, and stuck to it for far too long rather than criticizing internally such a, such a cynical and uh, 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 assault really on, 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 on people who could least afford to pay um, more out of their, their household income. So that's my first observation. In, in the meantime, we have seen um, a, a, a Tory party that has gone on particularly after 2015, but it started during the coalition years. And we were obviously on board with tightening belts and, 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 and fair enough, I too, I. I was quite on board with the message of um, austerity at first, I have to say that, but it obviously went far beyond any necessary means in order to stabilize the economy. And, and at the very latest by 2012 or 13, we should have said, this is no longer supportable. Um, uh, this is, these are ideological cuts and they are based um, on, on an ideology, ideology, ideology that the private sector is always better than the public sector and a relentless assault on the welfare state. And that's where we are now. Um, universal basic incomes is, is, is just um, the most cynical, cynically small amount of money that, pe that we are asking people to live on. So just under 5,000 pounds, who can live on that? And yet we are asking thousands of people uh, uh, to live on that, and um, when, when, but when the welfare system was first first introduced, it was there to support everybody in need, um, in order to actually continue a decent life. You cannot live a decent life on that amount of money, and this is obviously becoming very clear now, in the COVID crisis, where suddenly a lot of people um, are facing unemployment. And again, what would have been my response, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the COVID crisis, is to support uh, the amount of money that should go into universal credit double it, you know, by the time um, we would have doubled um, universal credit, so to 10,000 pounds rather than 5,000 uh, pounds, that would have made all the difference. The reason why we are talking about universal basic income now is because, and the welfare uh, system is completely destroyed, um, and we need to look around um, for, for ways of helping people to survive. And I'm not surprised that people who are on an income, let's say, of 25 or 30,000 pounds suddenly say, what? I have to go on universal credit. How can I live on 5,000 pounds? Well, hang on. That's what we are asking a lot of other people to do. So suddenly we are coming in with the idea of universal basic income. 
But what is it for? Is it there for to give everybody an extra amount of money, including me, who is d doesn't need it? Um, or are we doing it only because universal credit is not enough? And I think when we are asking about what is universal basic income for, uh, we have to ask ourselves a very uh, uh, honest questions of why we are doing this in the first place. Because if you're giving it to everybody, uh, then somebody has to pay for it. You know, we all know that that money doesn't grow on trees. So why I should should I get, for example, another ten thousand pounds a year when I'm actually earning uh, uh, what, what is it now, seventy to eighty thousand pounds a year? I don't need the money. I'm not asking for it. Um, we are thinking about it because the welfare system is broken. And if universal basic income is used as a as an argument to completely destroy or take away the benefit system, I'm a little bit worried about it because I think as long as it's universal and helps everybody uh, who is in need, but it's targeted support rather than spreading it around everybody, I'd rather uh, you know, uh, reform um, um, the welfare state rather than coming up with a completely new idea that hasn't been tested. Uh, nobody is very clear of what the amount should be and nobody has told me um, how it's going to be paid for. But I'm happy to discuss this because I know it's a big discussion um, within the Lib Dems right now. And I don't know what you think about it. You know, should it go to everybody? What's the, the amount of money? Is it 10,000 pounds? Is it 20,000 pounds? Is it less? Uh, then people say to me, well, but um, you know, somebody like you, Vera, if you don't need it, uh, it can be done through the tax system. Well, okay, I'm pa paying what, 40% tax. I still keep 60% out of the 10,000 pounds that I'm given. How's it going to work? I'm not entirely certain. Yeah, I've, I've always thought we should be protecting the most vulnerable, and that's people on low incomes. Um, but whenever I've read about um, universal basic income, I can never find a paper that says about housing costs, because that's in addition to that £5,000 we're going to give everybody. So you can't rent a house for £5,000 a year, for example, in some, in some locations. Um, we have places in Bedford where families are paying £1,100 a month for a property to rent. So if you only give them 5,000 um, plus th the housing costs, one I find it will be unaffordable. And then the people that are left behind, are the people that really need the money, like the disabled, the vulnerable, um, the people with long-term health conditions. Um, so I, would, I, I see universal credit as the universal benefit that is available, but it's available for people that need it. And if we, if we did increase the work allowances, if we did make sure you get a universal credit payment within seven days instead of five weeks when you claim it, and then the universal credit kicks in when you lose your job or you have a change of circumstances or you become sick, people would have that safety net and it would include their housing costs um, until they're able to get back on their feet again. But, and I but, think is what the welfare... Yeah, but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. But then that's not universal basic income. That's just improving um, the wealth, you know, the welfare and benefits system. So I am absolutely on board uh, mm. with making sure that our benefit system works properly. And by the way, of course, people get housing benefit on top of um, universal credit. Um, but ca can I just sort of come, sorry to interrupt you. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. One of the biggest issues that we have in this country is the cost of housing. Yeah, that is what stretches um, um, household incomes, particularly those that are that that that, that are uh, very stretched. But I'm so, I, I, sorry, I interrupted you. But I I still can't quite understand why you call that universal basic income when really you're talking about improving the benefit system. And I worry that if we talk about universal basic income, we are not talking about benefits. We are talking about something else, no, and it's thing, not. Hmm? The thing is, universal credit is available for everybody when they need it. When they don't need it, it can be withdrawn and tapered because they're now got back on their feet and they don't need it anymore. So uh, it's, it's kind of probably semantics, but the, the system that's kind of been set up has been um, kind of um, dug apart by the Tories since 2010 in terms of what it was meant to be in that they've reduced the work allowances in 2015 when we weren't part of the government. And also, if somebody gets to that low threshold of low income, they've got universal credit to claim. So the system is nearly there, but we can't replace it with a universal basic income. I am against universal basic income. As All right, whole. okay, so we agree. I don't, I don't, <laughs> sorry, I don't think everybody should get a universal basic, basic income. I would yeah, like I a state to look after the most vulnerable. 
Oh, perfect. Sorry, I misunderstood that. I agree. Same page as you, really. Uh, Martin, I can see you come off uh, mute. Do you want to follow up on that? I, raised, I was trying to raise my hand. I was trying to be smart. <laughs> um, hello, Vera. Vera. Hi. Um, uh, some context. So I, my dad is in a dementia home in North London. We currently pay £2,500 a week for that care. And the care and social care environment with the COVID-19 crisis has been front and centre in the news agenda. It sometimes disappears off the new agenda because uh, the Tories decide not to talk about it and then the press uh, don't talk about it either. My question is, um, and it's a battle across uh, the Western world when it comes to coping with dementia and Alzheimer's, it's almost this unhidden growing problem with an elderly um, population is what solutions should we be looking at and what things have you considered um, I have friends who live in Denmark, live in Finland and Sweden, where there's more social care. There's a, they're happy to pay more tax. The, the there's a there's a good wraparound. Uh, dare I say it, about Heige, but you know that's kind of the good way of living. But I'm I'm I don't get any of that. Me and my family don't get any of that two and a half thousand pounds back. There's no tax relief, but I know. But that's the situation we find ourselves in. And I just wonder what your opinion was around social care and um, care in the community and how we fund that going forward. Because I know Dave does a great job in Bedford, but across the country, it varies from, from region to region and borough to borough. So compared to many European countries, um, we, along with the United States, pride ourselves um, in uh, being a low tax country. And that obviously has its price. So if we want and believe in good public services, which I do, then of course we need to ask ourselves how, how are we going to pay for it? Um, and you know, ultimately only through a contribution, higher contributions from everybody. But that obviously takes a big national debate and um, pr um, numerous governments have tried to um, raise this issue and said, oh, let's take to do a health and social care commission. They'll be taking it out of the party political ding dong and come uh, uh, to some sort of conclusion to it. But personally, I, 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 because it hasn't happened, um, and I've said previously, it's, sometimes it's very difficult to cooperate with people who come ideologically from very different corners of the political spectrum. I just worry that this will never, A, never happen, and B, never come to a particular con conclusion. So I would say as a progressive, uh, we need to uh, encourage the country to think progressively and, and think about um, better public services and a higher tax contribution. And in fact, we as Liberal Democrats have actually made um, uh, a good start with um, our, our manifestos, a penny in the pound of income tax for health and social care. That is probably not going to be enough, um, but at least it's a beginning. It is, it is um, you're shaking your head. You, you're also- No, I agree. I, I agree. I agree. I think we should pay more. Yeah, but, it, but, but that's... It's highly it unpopular. Be... It's highly, highly unpopular, but you just it, have it, to get used to it. It, it, it is. And, 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 here, and, and here, here you would get somebody uh, as a leader who say, OK, come on, guys. We cannot always shirk the difficult questions. Um, and we need to persuade. And we need to persuade because we are convinced and we have full convictions that that is the right way to go. And I, I happen to believe that good public services is the right way to go because it ultimately... Uh, 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 narrows the inequality gap because otherwise if we leave everything to the private sector clearly um, we are creating more and more unequal society so uh, we need to bite the bullet um, about um, um, tax contributions and why we are doing it and in fact it's not that unpopular so uh, uh, if you have opinion polls around dedicated tax around something uh, like for example health and social care you'll find that actually quite a lot of the public um, is, is in favour of, uh, of uh, uh, having a dedicated tax or extra contribution if they know exactly where it goes to. One of the good ways of actually finding public consensus are citizens' assemblies. It is a wonderful tool of actually having out all the arguments, getting people from different kinds of backgrounds, communities, different parts of the country together in one room, outside the party political ding-dong, to discuss an issue seriously and not take people for fools. And, and quite a lot of these things could, for example, be put into something like citizens' assemblies, where we have a citizen assembly 
on health and social care, where we are getting the political buy-in from the population and the people rather than trying to sort of bridge some sort of ideological divide between parties. So I think that, for example, could be part of a, uh, of a citizens' assembly of how we want to uh, negotiate that citizens' assembly's work. Um, a particular example is, uh, the, not, uh, is the Irish um, uh, d discussion on uh, changing the abortion laws. And to the surprise of everybody in the world almost, um, uh, the Irish people overwhelmingly voted for a reform in abortion laws. That would have never happened if it was, ha had been left to a party political debate. So um, I have quite, I've got a lot of confidence in people. I remember once our party slogan was, we trust in people. I trust in people. I trust in democracy. I think citizens' assemblies are possibly a very good way forward in, 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 in uh, addressing very contentious and difficult issues and finding a consensus and a, um, a buy-in from the grassroots. I believe in people. Thank you. Uh, Dave, does that answer your um, follow-up question on funding for, I suppose, a little bit more on adult social care? I mean, I can I, I can sort of elaborate a little bit bit on this. It's, it's not just um, the United Kingdom that uh, uh, struggles with uh, uh, proper funding for health and social care. We are an aging population. Um, we are living. We are all living a lot longer. That's a good thing. Um, but our models of paying into um, into pensions um, has been based on an old-fashioned um, thinking or fact that people would work until they're sixty or sixty-five and then work, live for another ten years or so. And then they die and they, you know, on the assumption often that, that illnesses were quite short um, and either people survived um, or, or came out of a hospital again. Whereas these days, in the last um, decades or two, three decades, we are dealing with a population and the long term unwell and we are living a lot longer. And, and a lot of that, I mean, the, the miracles of, of medicine should also be celebrated. Um, but the models um, of how we pay for, for, for adult, you know, for our old age are based on old um, fashioned models of how much it would cost. And a lot of people on the door server say, I paid into this all my life. And then you have to remind them to say, well, the money would have run out 10 years ago if you're now 80. Um, and, 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 and people need to understand that. And if you make that connection and people start to understand uh, 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 you, you know, what it takes in order to fund good adult social care and, and, and our old age, people are not stupid, they understand that. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I know there's a few um, questions on, um, I suppose, more on the party and they've been waiting for a, a while. So um, I suppose I'd like to shift, shift it onto there considering the time. Um, Henry, are you all right to start with yours? Yeah, I'll read it very quickly, but it cropped up recently, I'm sure, where you did comment on it when it did crop up. A Worcestershire um, local party um, organised an event with Lord Reynolds speaking at it originally, and obviously Mark <laughs> Pack stepped in to offer to speak instead. His poor reputation, and one of the women who um, made, let's call them credible allegations, as the QC concluded, um, uh, about Lord Reynolds lives in Bedford, but um, his poor reputation continues to resurface. He continues to speak as a Liberal Democrat peer in the House of Lords. He continues to have power, therefore, as a Liberal Democrat politician nationally. Um, and I know the Lords Liberal Democrat group is an independent group, effectively, within the, within the Lords. But will you commit to doing, it might be a really quick answer, I don't know, but will you commit to doing everything in your power to remove Lord Renard from the Lords Liberal Democrat group? And more generally, what should be done to help stamp out um, ongoing discrimination, in, in particular sexism, um, within, within the party? Well, we have to be more honest about it um, and what happened and, and, and not just so say these things happened in the past, but continue to talk about it um, in the present because um, there continue to be situations where, for example, staff members, I know that too, feel uncomfortable with um, certain attitudes, certain behaviours of, um, I, let's face it, often older uh, uh, members of our party. Um, and Lord Reynard has to understand uh, that he is a, you know, he's a great big block to our party moving forward. So ideally, of course, he would himself say, all right, um, I leave the party and I speak as an independent. Um, and in the meantime, the party has struggled to um, remove him because he does have um, a lot of support within the party. So 
I think the best we can do in order to not split the party and, and not um, let that controversy become such a public thing that our, our party itself is then associated in the public um, with this continuing issue. I think we need to work much more in the background in order to make um, people understand why Lord Renard is particularly for women and such a block to move forward and why they feel uncomfortable to share a platform or a room with them. That, that's as, as much as I can say. I, I think to have a very big public ding dong about it is possibly not um, uh, not the best way forward because as we can't quite afford it. I know that sounds uh, uh, a little bit feeble because I've said previously we should be uncompromising. I think behind the, behind the scenes we should be very uncompromising. Actually, Jo has tried her very best um, and I know the biggest block about moving forward comes actually from, from um, uh, his friends in the Lords who continue to protect him. Um, and, and so that's really where the discussions have to be had and where my, my colleagues in the law need to understand what I believe uh, for women um, and, and other minorities who feel uncomfortable uh, is at stake here. Uh, but I, 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 think basic, I think it's not great to have that public debate. It has to be a debate within the party. How much that will then go out into the public space because we're having that debate is of course a separate matter. But my first port of call would be as if I was the leader to go back to the Lords and address that issue um, and how, I, how concerned I am about the, the general overall reputation of the party, but also the cohesion within the party about Lord, Lord Renard still being there. But I'm happy for you to come back about it. You go a well, bit like... Um, if I very I'm, quickly come back a bit, I, I mean, I think it, it was behind closed doors. I, I'm, I'm sort of, th th there's a tension there, isn't there, between calling this stuff out publicly when we should call it out publicly, which you rightly said we should, I, I completely agree with you there, and actually being quite frank about it's still going on and that it's an issue that needs raising. But at the same time saying, well, perhaps we shouldn't have a public ding dong about it, perhaps we shouldn't talk about it publicly. But the reason it came out publicly was because people were fed up with trying to deal with it in an internal context and and i you know i i've met members of our house of lords group who seem completely oblivious to the fact that a lot of people um who i'm going to say who are my generation within the party but a lot of people i talk to uh, you, you know in different local parties are horrified and deeply uncomfortable by the fact that that person within our party still has more power it sits in an unelected chamber as a liberal democrat peer with our party label on his house of lords website so I, I, I mean, I think it is inevitably public, unfortunately. Yeah, and, 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 and possibly I have said at the very beginning to Graham, I don't know everything. This is why I, I enjoy having um, good, solid, um, robust discussions with uh, members of local parties. I'm open to persuasion to um, um, open this discussion publicly again, if, if, uh, if there's really um, a big need for doing that. Um, I, you know, watch this space, but I'm not the leader yet, so. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, Joy, I know you've been waiting a while for your question. Would you like to ask yours? Oh, you're on, you're on mute. Oh, I can ask it for you. I mean, uh, coming back to the, to the comeback, uh, I think actually whether you're a leader or not, um, we, we, there's 11 MPs, um, we are a party of equals. Um, if we want to have that discussion again, I think um, we should talk about it. And, you know, leader or not, I'm quite happy to take that up again, to be quite honest. So uh, let's talk again. Let's talk in the future. Thank you. Uh, Joy, I think you're ready. Yes, I'm ready. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my question is rather more long term in terms of our focus before the next general election. And I read a very interesting article um, in the Lib Dem Voice, I think it was, uh, that talked about our need to focus um, and how we might be more successful if we did focus on floating voters. I have to declare, um, Vera, uh, without apology, and to my other colleagues in Bedford, that actually I did for the first time in my life not vote Lib Dem at the recent general election. Um, I followed targeting advice that I read online 
and I was so determined, a great supporter of Henry, nothing against Henry, or the local Lib Dems, I'm very supportive, but I have to say, um, I, I listened care. I was determined to do all I could to keep the Tories out. And I think, um, I hope my vote helped in a way, a small way to do that. What do you think about our plan for targeted um, um, supporters, uh, of which I'm sure there are lots in the country um, um, who are fed up with both the other parties? Um, and um, what do you think about that, Vera? Well, I think you're, you're, you're right, absolutely right. Uh, and I think um, more people should have done that in the last election. Uh, and if um, something like a progressive alliance is work, should, would work, it would have to work like this. I can't see uh, uh, necessarily that we can achieve formal um, uh, alliances with the Labour Party because currently, you know, their party statutes doesn't allow it for, you know, as I understand it, so they have to stand a candidate in every seat. But if we are talking um, about a progressive alliance, we have to understand um, where, who is the party that can beat the conservatives. And if our message is that we need to get the conservative out, the conservatives out, as you um, have just explained the reason why you voted and not for Lib Dem, um, but um, for the Labour Party candidate, I assume, mm -hmm. um, then that is the, the overall message that we need to get out there. And so do Labour, Labour Party members need to understand uh, that where the Lib Dems, like in seats in the Southwest, um, are the best placed party to beat the Conservatives, then the Labour Party should give us a free run, not necessarily not by standing a candidate. And I, I understand that it's, it's actually quite unpopular um, to stand a candidate down, but not to fire um, political um, fire at each other. And we can also do that by actually sharing some messages. So and in many, many ways, um, we share messages with the Labour Party. Um, for example, on how to tackle the climate emergency, we had very similar messages on, on, the, on the climate emergency. For example, on the need of building a lot more social homes for rent, we have got similar targets, unlike the Labour Party, of addressing the housing crisis. We, we talked uh, um, earlier about uh, one of the biggest difficulty for household budgets is actually the unaffordable unaffordability of housing. And we can only um, address that by, by making social house building a national project and the, the Labour Party wants to do that and it's part of our manifesto as well. A hundred thousand social homes for rent every year, that's our target. So it, also in terms of messaging, we can overlap better with the Labour Party um, and I think what you have done is absolutely the right thing and I wish in the forthcoming election more people would understand that. In, in Bath, I couldn't have won without the support of the Labour, Labour voters um, and we have been joking I've been joking with one of the Labour Party members that um, um, he was voting for me and my daughter, was vote, who's a Liberal Democrat, was voting for the Labour Party uh, uh, candidate in, uh, in her constituency in, in London. So uh, these, these is absolutely what I think is the only way of getting the Tories out at the next election. So you, you are right and we need to do it more. That's not quite what I wanted to hear, Vera. Okay. What, what did you want to hear? Uh, <laughs> to hear that we Liberal Democrats on our own without trying to negotiate with Labour or be too angry with the Tories we've got them for the next goodness knows how long maybe even longer after that God help us um, and um, so uh, we've got a good strong base of data I know Bedford is excellent um, I just now, I've only lived here seven years or something, but you know, I'm most impressed by the data that Bedford has got. Um, and I think that now is our opportunity to be able to start communicating more about ourselves, not going ding dong. We're not going to get uh, PR in my lifetime. I'm only 77, but I'm sure we're not going to get it in my lifetime. Um, and I think we should be um, ploughing our own furrow, if that's the phrase to use, and really um, engaging people who are not committed particularly to other parties, but who do continue to, to vote. 
so do I understand that you think we should blow our own trumpet better and, and not um, talk about a progressive alliance? Is that what you're saying? No, no, I'm not saying that. That's what something that you as leader would be doing from a parliamentary point of view. But I'm saying that locally, our way to win seats has always been um, from communication. And I, oh, I, I know what you're saying. I think I know what you're saying now, that locally, uh, we should make the most of our campaigning power um, and of the fact that we are uh, incredibly good um, uh, grassroots activists and, and use that knowledge and that power in order to win locally and, 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 and overtake the Labour Party in, in that way. And, I, and again, I think you're absolutely right. Um, that's a way of how we're actually also shifting from what I said at the very beginning, focus um, from the general, um, you know, the, the, the general sort of London-centric uh, and London-focused party more into our local areas where we are empowering and giving more resources to local parties to, as you say, follow their own, their own luck. Uh, and and I, I do believe that is um, one of the most powerful way of, of, of making our way back into, um, into building power bases at a local level and from there um, go and, um, uh, and, and make progress at a national level. Thank you. Um, Dave, did you have a follow-up question? Yes, I'm getting off mute. Um, good evening. Um, just um, in terms of the um, deals and alliances, there are there is a, a school of thought that uh, where we stood down in alliances, whether that be in Richmond uh, or in South Oxfordshire, we actually lost seats and we could have had outright control. Um, so in Bedford, we do stand against the Labour Party. We we by we've had to have an administration with them because we don't have a majority, uh, but we do fight them. Uh, and actually, we took three seats off them in May. Um, and in seats we can't win, there are some seats that we don't do any work, but we still give people the opportunity to do that. I think our campaign um, helped Labour to win uh, by actually saying there was no Conservative councillors in Bedford. And I think by not standing against Labour and actually doing that alliance, you harm the Liberal Democrats. Um, I, I didn't say that you shouldn't stand. I think that I, I very clearly said that um, standing down is not something that is popular with people um, and is not particularly successful. Um, but we need to understand um, what we also do in messaging in terms of firing as much um, political fire at the Labour Party as, as, as the Tory party as we did in the last um, general election. That was a mistake. And the way Paddy Ashton um, uh, arranged um, an informal alliance with the Labour Party um, was to, to a great advantage to us. When Labour is doing well, we are doing well, and we need to recognise that. But I don't believe that we, we do that necessarily by standing down, and certainly at a local level, uh, I think um, you're up to those who are fighting the Labour Party, and I, you know, I'm not, if, 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 if I was that um, wedded to the Labour Party, I could become a member of the Labour Party. I don't. Uh, I found them extremely and extraordinarily annoying when I was um, a councillor and watched her. So I, I well understand um, that, you know, we are not just sort of lying down and let the Labour Party take over. Um, but we need to understand where electorally uh, we need to make sure that we beat the Tories and how we do that best is often obviously dependent on our local circumstances. And you in Bedford, you know best how to beat, uh, uh, how, how to beat the Tories overall if that's what we want to achieve at the next general well, we election. Took, we actually took more seats off Labour than Tories, but uh, I did ask a question about social care, but I'm quite happy to have an answer later on because it's quite a long one. Yeah, I mean, we are, we are sort of coming, coming yeah, no. uh, to, 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 to the end um, of, of the session anyway. The one thing that we haven't really touched about, um, but I'm, I'm passionate to talk about, is, is actually the climate emergency. Um, and I, 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 have, uh, I don't know whether any of your representatives has... Uh, joined my climate cluster, but as a spokesperson for the climate emergency every Tuesday morning at 10, uh, now that everything has moved on Zoom, it's much easier for people to join me. And um, councillors, um, uh, particularly those with, who are either leaders or uh, environment spokespeople, have joined my Zoom call, um, how to tackle the climate emergency and particularly what we can do at local level and empower uh, 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 you at, as councillors at local level and what needs to be done in order to shift decision-making power and resources so that where we have declared climate emergencies and where we are running councils, you 
uh, can can demonstrate that what the, the, the power of the local delivery and I'm, I'm very keen to talk about that in the last uh, uh, maybe next sort of 10 minutes or so because uh, th that's one of my particular passions if I, if I Graeme you don't mind I mean we've reduced our, our carbon by 42 percent since we've been here uh, and there are lots of stuff we did reply to your survey and, and I'd love to have some uh, some feedback for that I think that was January um, so if there's any chance your team can give us feedback about what you've got across the country that would be really useful. Yeah, I mean, we, um, the, the, we, we got so much information into the climate cluster that in the end we felt that the best way of, of doing it is sort of um, a, a grouping all the things that were most important to councillors across the country um, into, um, into se sessions that, that we organise on a Tuesday morning. So we have, uh, we have had some great sessions and if you can join us on a Tuesday morning and zoom in, um, please email my office um, and we send you a Zoom um, invitation and you'll see um, the, the agenda that we have until the end of um, July, uh, where we are talking about different topics um, separately. So we've talked about um, um, energy from waste um, and recycling. We have talked about the new Green Deal, uh, last and planning and, and, and buildings and insulation. And I can't quite remember what we are doing next week, next Tuesday, but please join us because that's probably um, the, the, the best way of also um, engaging, but also getting some some answers. Um, uh, if if I can if I can uh, push you in that direction, that would be great. Okay. Are there uh, are there any more questions or comments on on, on the environment or? I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to, to put out um, some of the, the, the headlines about our thinking as a party and my thinking as a climate spokesperson. So um, we developed um, a policy for tackling the climate emergency and it was adopted at uh, uh, the last conference. And the headlines then were we are, we are cutting most emissions by 2030. Um, we get to net zero by 2045. And there has been an internal discussion whether that was ambitious enough. Um, and that discussion will um, reignite probably after we're coming out of COVID. Mainly, one, one of the reasons why we pushed um, the target to 2045 was the aviation industry. Uh, and we assumed that it would be difficult to cut emissions from aviation before 2045. And one of the things that we as Liberal Democrats always are, we like to be evidence-based and realistic rather than just sort of picking a target out of the air um, and, and then not delivering it. So, I, uh, I would like to encourage everybody to actually go into our 80-page document, but it sets out in great detail how we get to, to net zero. Um, and we are, we are basically um, uh, separating different sectors out. The reason why aviation um, was one of the sectors where we find we can't get to net zero was um, because of fuel. So um, other than the Green Party, for example, we don't say we want to stop flying or we're against flying. Why we don't like flying is because airplanes are fueled by by a fossil fuel so as long as um, the aviation industry can actually replace fossil fuels with um, synthetic fuels uh, you know we are not against flying anymore just flying has to be net zero um, and that is perfectly possible um, i've had um, many discussions in the last few weeks about um, blending fuels um, and getting to synthetic fuels and by the way that's not about biofuels that's about synthetic fuels and basically what a synthetic fuel is, is a, is, is a carbon source, a carbon dioxide source, um, which is reutilized where the carbon bit has been taken out um, and where it's blended in uh, uh, and can be gradually blended in. In fact, there is, is already a mechanism through the renewable fuel obligations um, where we can actually do this. Um, and the government is just not using this. So there's actually the, the main message about getting to net zero is we can do it, we know how to do it. Lord Deben, the um, chair of the Committee for Climate Change keeps saying that this is not, um, uh, climate uh, change is not an issue where we are sitting there, oh my God, what are we going to do? We know exactly what we, what we need to do. It needs political will, direction from government. We Liberal Democrats have got a very clear program of what we want to do. And we can possibly, uh, now that COVID, um, uh, with COVID, the aviation industry has dramatically changed, we can possibly put that, forward, that target forward to 2040. And that would be something uh, that I'm very much concentrating on. Okay, uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, Christine, do, uh, I suppose, in terms of um, last questions and wrapping up, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Or maybe just say a few things. Um, 
so thank you Vera thank you for uh talking to us and it's been very enjoyable listening to you and I'm sorry uh I don't intend to be a buzzkill I'm trying to be encouraging um I put the comment in about like the, that we're gullible fools and how are we ever going to increase our MPs if we keep being gullible fools and we keep saying oh poor Labour their constitution doesn't allow them to stand down candidates we're gullible fools that are being gobbled up by Labour and the Greens and we need to stop it so that's my view on that also we were right although we should have said more against the Tories we were right given that we were at the time of the general election a single string message i.e anti-brexit uh, which doesn't even fly here in bedford um given that we were a single string thing it was quite right to point out labor were not an anti-brexit party uh, that that's my view um so overall the bit that where i'd really like to encourage the parliamentary team i mean you're passionate about the environment i know that and i've listened to your conference i'm passionate about the environment and as has been explained you know in bedford we are very very active on that for the last three months, the running the council, our heads have just been full of real frontline stuff. Even today, you know, there's a new data set out from the government. We're saying, why is our death rate 100 per 100,000 instead of the, the average of uh, East of England average of 60? Why are we responsible for 40% of the deaths in the East of England right now? You know, these are the real frontline things. And I'm afraid kind of all the biofuels um, and stuff is, is just kind of the wrong thing at this time. We should be making constructive comments about the government's mismanagement of, of this, this thing. It really is disgraceful. And more generally, I, I do think we, we always tend to come across as rather middle class and irrelevant because not because climate change is irrelevant to people it's not but because we fail to communicate why it's relevant just as we fail to communicate why pr is relevant pr always sounds like an intellectual exercise whereas it's actually to do with justice it's actually to do with people having an equal say and we need to communicate that just as we need to communicate why actually climate change isn't just for kids and people who have leisure time climate change is actually something for all of us that benefits us all so i'd like us to sound a lot more relevant sound a lot more day-to-day -day relevant and and where we completely miss out in our public messaging is that social justice what dean was saying about you know people struggling on um on universal credit and that's only going to get worse with the economy collapsing you know we should be championing social justice to help the poor and i know that i know that climate change feeds into that but say so let's let's make what we talk about more relevant to more people's day-to-day -day lives um and christina I, I couldn't agree more but i think um I hope you understand from my messages that probably you on the ground understand much better what works in your local area. For example, when you talk about the climate emergency, then putting out a massive central message, that doesn't mean that we centrally say, we need to tackle the climate emergency and we need to get to net zero by 2040, or we, we need to um, attack central government for its inaction because that's basically what, it, what central government does. Um, they are uh, climate change delayers, I always say, and that's no better mm -hmm. than climate change deniers because, um, you know, if we, if we hit the target, then we are, you know, it's just as bad as not doing anything about it. Um, because we all know, unless we uh, limit temperature rises to 1.5%, we're all going to be toast. Um, and but particularly, and this is why I always say we liberal Democrats are particularly committed to tackling the climate emergency. It will create huge global inequalities. And, and, and as a party of social justice, not just here, but also abroad, we care about people further afield than, 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 than just our immediate neighborhood. And, and that is where we're very unique. We, we focus very much on our, our um, immediate local um, uh, uh, grassroots and, 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 and direct campaigning. But we also understand the wider world. And that is a very unique mix, and which is why I love being a liberal Democrat. I like the fact that we can do both. We can, do, we can be very local, but we can also be very international. Um, and, 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 and how we best communicate that 
um, and, and which messages um, land best um, is probably best done by, by, by local councils and local councils and local activists. Um, why do we sound irrelevant? I don't think actually we, we necessarily do. Um, and again, the, the reason why, why, why it looks like we, we are not relevant is because we, we focus always on how our national message is cutting through. And as the third or fourth party in parliament, it is obviously very difficult um, to cut through. And, and that's the nature of post past the post. And that is also the nature why we need to change the voting system, because it is ultimately very unfair and the political discourse is only ever between two big parties. And we, I mean, whoever has been a Liberal Democrat um, for the last 10 or 15 or five years knows that this is one of our biggest challenges. How do we cut through? Usually we cut through best locally. And so for that reason, let's make the most of that. Um, yes, of course you can say, you know, we, 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 we like to pick, uh, we like to pick these sort of more esoteric, more, um, bigger picture uh, philosophical questions, but that's not true. I mean, we, we also pick the very practical, very, how do we help people on the, on the day-to-day -day basis in, uh, in our communities? And we make the best local councils. And ultimately when we do have, uh, when we, we do manage to get MPs elected, we do provide um, the best MPs in parliament because people trust us and where many, many Lib Dem MPs are in there for a long time because we demonstrate our de dedication to people's everyday lives, to people's everyday worries and to, to, to address how they each and if every one of them can live a better life. And that's what I'm committed to. And that is, I think, um, where li we Liberal Democrats are uh, and where we should go forward confidently um, with our message uh, and we will make progress. I'm, I, I am convinced um, if we give local, local areas particularly the power to, uh, to, to, to create and make their own fortunes. Thanks. Okay, so I think um, that is all, all the questions um, we, we have. Um, but um, I suppose um, thank you very much um, for for, for coming and, and for, for talking to us in Bedford. And thank you very much for, for all your questions and everything. Um, hopefully it was a, a good, good, good conversation, a good debate. Um, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody. Um, I, I thought it was very thought provoking. Um, I, uh, I enjoy being challenged. Um, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll meet again, not in a virtual, but in a physical space. Although I believe the next conference is going to be virtual. Um, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist in terms of how, where we go and, and, and what we can achieve. I'm an optimist generally. Um, I'm, I, I love my party. I think we're a great team. We've got lots to go for us. Um, so let's keep going. Good luck for your next set, set of elections um, and see you all soon.